So we're going to dabble briefly with the idea of object-oriented programming. We've been using objects since we started programming because everything in Python is an object. Right, you have a string, but it's also got some functions like to test to see if a string has got a character in it or, you know, you got a floating point number, but you can do other things with it. What an object is, is it's a piece of data with functions attached to it. And we usually think of those as being completely separate things, right? I have a function and it's going to use my data, but you have data with functions attached to it. And an example of that is something like, if I make a string, and I stick some data in it, right? There are other functions I can use that are attached to that data, like s dot is alpha, parentheses, in parentheses, right? So the data is a string, but it's got functions attached to it, like is alpha, is numeric, is digit, is stuff like that. So that's definitely going to be false because it is not all digits which is what is digit would check for. We can get a list of the functions that are available to a specific data type. If we do DIR, and we say, oh boy, that string actually has a whole bunch of different things that it can do. Like here's an interesting one, replace. We could replace all the A's with O's in this string, so S, dot replace quote a end quote quote o end quote and then boom it changed data to doto now it didn't actually change the string but it created a new one which we could have saved in a new variable so if we wanted to save that we would have had to do s is equal to s dot replace and so on so this works because string is what's known as a class and classes are used to create objects a class is effectively a blueprint, just like you're going to build yourself a house, you buy a blueprint, and then you go and you hire a team and they go and build your house for you, and then your neighbor likes the idea so much that he goes and he takes your blueprint and he builds another house identical to yours. You now have two houses, but only one blueprint. So the blueprint's the imaginary thing, the objects are the real things that you make from it. We're going to get back to arrays in just a moment, but I want to talk about the objects first. But first, classes and objects. This is known as object-oriented programming. You define a class, which is a blueprint, for an object. What is an object? An object is a collection of data and functions that work on that data, that use that data. So we can make a student class, and we're going to track several pieces of information about that student. We're going to track his first name, his last name, and the uh, student ID num, something like that. So the way you define a class is with the class keyword. And so we're going to make a class called student. And this is going to look a little bit weird, and we have to get the syntax exactly right. DEF space, and then I'm going to be using double underscores here. Underscore, underscore, I-N-I-T, underscore, underscore. Two underscores before, two underscores after, with a space before it. If you get that perfectly right, everything will go great. Parentheses, self, comma, uh, that's enough. Self, parentheses, self, end parentheses, colon. And now we're going to type in three things. Self.name equals, like that. I guess we're just going to use a first name. I mean, a whole name. And then a self dot SID for student ID. A 
And now we're going to make a function which will print out this student. Oh, we have to have one more piece of information other than the name. How about a, a school that they're going to? Enrollment date, graduation date, something like that. Just self.school equals a pair of empty quotes. So now we're going to make a function, and a function that's attached to an object, a function that's part of a class is called a method. It's a fancy name for function, which is another fancy name for module. So def print, parentheses, self, in parentheses, colon, and I'll explain what that self means in just a minute. And so what we're going to do is we're going to print student, end quote, comma, self.name, close parentheses, print parentheses, school, end quote, comma, self.school, and print parentheses, I, SID, student ID, end quote, comma, self.sid. And I'm going to put a little comment here that this is the end of our class. So we can create multiple student objects. In the past what our variables have been doing is either they've been a list, an array, of individual pieces of data, or they have been one piece of data, right? But if it was a list, it was like a list of all of the same thing. I had a list of scores. I had an array of, you know, of student names, something like that. Well, in this case, this is going to be one piece of data that's carrying around different chunks of data inside it, like this. S1 equals student, capital S, as long as you made that capital S. Open parentheses, close parentheses. S1.name equals Bob Roberts. S1.school equals quote OSU. S1.SID, student ID equals quote 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And now we're going to make another student. S2 equals student. And just fill in different information. You don't have to type my information in exactly. S2.name equals an Emric. S2.school equals rose. S2.student ID equals 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, whatever, right? And now these functions, now these pieces of data can be passed around like variables are, because they are a variable. S1 is a variable that contains three different pieces of information. An object is a group of data, a group of variables with functions that act on it. Well, we've really only written two functions. One is the init function that builds it, sets it up, creates a name and a student ID in a school. But we did add this print module, this print function, this print method. Let's call it s1.print, parentheses in parentheses, s2.print, parentheses in parentheses, like that. All right, so I ran it, and we see student Bob Roberts, school OSU, student ID 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then the second print statement created student Ann Emmerich, school rows, SID 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, whatever. 
And we could make the output look prettier, right, if we wanted to. Put colons here and space them out so that all three of these things would line up nice, right, like that. Or we could use some printed format commands, which we've seen occasionally where we use like percent %s or percent %f. Anyways, that'll make it look a little bit prettier. All right, so that's the idea of an object. The objects that we have been using that are most conceptually similar to this have been the turtles. Because every turtle has an X position on the screen and a Y position on the screen. It's got, you know, a, uh, a color. Every turtle has a color, a thickness, a speed. And we could easily create two turtles and have them going around the screen, or four turtles and have them going around the screen all at the same time, because each one is an object, its own object. Each turtle is this collection of those pieces of data, its X position, its Y position, the angle that it's going at, the thickness of the pin, the color of the pin, the speed that it's going to, whether the pin is lifted or not. So they're pretty complicated objects, but that's because they do a lot of cool stuff. All right, so going back to the idea of arrays, we veered off from the arrays discussion to talk about using Python lists. What's the big difference? When you're using lists, you can create an empty list and then start adding elements to it. If you're using an arrays, an array is fixed in length. And we showed both of those things. When I create an empty list, it looks like this. L1 equals like that. Square brackets, and then you start adding things to it. L1.append. We could even be appending these students. We could append S1 and S2 and make an array, make a list of students. But let, let's just put, you know, some value in. Right. L1.append. 4, 5, 6. So, that is a list, and we added two elements to it. If we made another list, created it as an array, it would look like this. L2 equals, and we'd have to say, okay, I want this array to be numeric, so it's going to be a square brace, zero in square brace, and I want it to be two elements long. So in square times two, and then you could fill in L2 subscript zero with one, two, three, and L2 subscript one with four, five, six. Now we have two, two arrays that exactly match each other. One we just created as an array and addressed the elements as an array like that. And here we created as a list and started adding things to it. And in Python, these things are actually interchangeable. You could create as an array, and then you could start using data pins to it, right? Or once you make a list, then you can start accessing the elements by their index values, right? If we print it out, print parentheses L1 subscript 0, it's going to print 1, 2, 3. Stuff that's really good to know. Know how to create an array in Python. Let's just create several examples. A1 equals, this is going to be an array of ints. No, oh, wait, we've already done an array of ints. Why don't we do an array of strings? So that's an array of 10 strings. And that's an array of 5 ints. Then, know how 
print an array with a loop. There's two ways. There's index-based loops, and then there's value-based loops. Don't need to put all these in the actual comments because it's nice to see it actually run. Let's make an array called cars. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Besides know how to print an array with a loop, know how to create an array with an initialization list. So like cars, well here, let's do it actually. Cars equals square brace, quote, Mustang, end quote, comma, Camaro, end quote, comma, whatever. Get all fancy and drive a Lamborghini Coon Dash. Yeah, that's a bit weird. How about um, we're going to drive around in our Chevy Volt and then a Prius. There we go. Right. So now we have an array that we created with an initialization list. How do you get the length of the array with len array name? So x equals len cars. If we needed, now x contains the number of elements in that array. And as mentioned, two ways of printing it out. No, the two ways of printing an array out. With an index-based loop and a value-based loop. I may change this word from index to index range. Index range loop and the value base loop. So with an index for I in range parentheses len parentheses cars close parentheses close parentheses colon print I comma cars subscript I. And what's that going to do? It's going to print zero Mustang, one Camaro, two Volt, and three Prius because index zero is Mustang, index one is Camaro, index two is Volt, and index three is Prius. So this is printing it out by index. Why is it called printing it by index? Because we're using an index variable to retrieve the element from the array. Or you can print it out by list, excuse me, by value. For V or value in cars, colon, print parentheses value. This first one is how the textbook's going to be showing us all of the array manipulation. It's not going to even mention this one. So this is a perfectly good way of doing it. The syntax for this is a little bit cleaner. Here's what I ask you not to do is to get them confused. What do I mean by that? If I ask somebody to print an array on an exam and I ask you to do a free form, quite often I see people do this. Mix them up like this. This would be bad. Don't do this. Not for value in cars, print cars subscript value. I'd rather you just completely dump the idea of the value based for loop rather than mess it up like this. Why is that messing it up? Because this is going to be an element of the list. 
right? The first element of the list is Mustang. So at this point, value <laughs> equals Mustang, and then what does it mean to print cars subscript Mustang? That doesn't mean anything. We're mixing the two up. The other thing that people will do when, uh, if I ask them to print a list, is something like this. For I in range, LEN, cars, they set it up perfectly, and then they print out cars. Well, heck, we could take that out of the triple quotes and see what it's going to do. What's that going to do? Well, since we're not using the index, it's not going to print out Mustang followed on another line by Camaro followed on another line by Paul. It's going to just print the entire list four times in a row. It's not what we want. See what it did here? That printed out that. That's really not what I want. I don't want to see the list repeated four times in a row. I want to see either that or that. And of course, printing out I was just to kind of demonstrate the index values. It wasn't strictly necessary. I could come up here and remove the I comma, and it would be just as good. Wouldn't have those numbers down the side. Wouldn't look the way it did, but looks just as good, right? So what is wrong with the way that we just did it here? What would we have to do to fix this to get it to work right? This is just printing out all four of them four times in a row, but I only want to print them out one per line. So what do I need to do to change it so that this actually is an index-based print? I need to tack on something to cars here. I need to put something in subscripts, and what's that going to be? Yep, like that. So I guess if I was continuing my, I don't know if you want to write down all the wrong ways to do it, but here's another one. For I in range, L E in parentheses, cars in parentheses, in parentheses, colon, print I. What's that going to do? Is it going to print out any cars at all? Well, we could uncomment it out and see. But surely somebody has a prediction of what this is going to run before I uncomment it out. What is i equal to when it starts to step into this loop? What's the first value of i? Come on, guys. You know the answer if I did this. For i in range 10, print i. What's i equal to the first time it goes into the loop? Zero, right? Well, the only thing that's changed here is that, right? And so this is still going to print zero. And then it'll print out a one. And then it'll print out a two. And then it'll print out a three. So, wrong way of doing it. You don't want to just print out the numbers, the index numbers, you want to print them out. So if you wanted to fix that, again, you would put cars subscript i there. Like that. So that's another knot. Just print some numbers. Okay, let's make a couple more lists. Excuse me, arrays. We've got Jenny's phone number. It's equal to parentheses, or excuse me, square brace. 8, 6, 7, 5, 3, 0, 9. Now write an index-based loop that will print those numbers out one per line. So you're going to use a for loop. That's what I want you to do. I'm going to pause the recording while you do it. Write a for loop that prints the numbers one per line.
All right, so for I in range, what comes next? Len, what comes next? Jenny, close parentheses, close parentheses, colon, print, Jenny, subscript I. And if you did that I comma Jenny thing, that's okay too. It just prints the index numbers in front of it. Nothing wrong with that, but it's not strictly part of the solution, the exact solution, or the, the minimum would have been to do that. That's what the question asked for. So some of these slides, well, I guess we'll mention in a minute what we'll just go on from there. An array can replace nested decisions by doing something like this. Say you want to find out how many of your employees have zero dependents, and how many of your employees have one dependent, and how many employees have two, and how many employees have three, and how many employees have four, and how many employees have five. And so what you can do is you can read through your data, and each time you find somebody with zero dependents, you add it into the zero slot. And each time you find somebody with one dependent, you add it to the one slot, and so on. Now this particular way doesn't really scale well if this is some kind of data other than dependents, right? I mean, there's probably kind of an upper limit towards how many dependents one person might have. But if it was something else, some value that really didn't have a limit, then it's really hard to, uh, to create a histogram in that approach. And so here's what they're showing us doing is, do you have a dependent? Yeah, I don't have any dependents, so I'm going to add one to my count zero of dependents. Why don't we just show this in code? I really didn't want to spend too much time on this one. But for example, let's write a little loop that's going to roll a die 100 times in a row. And each time we roll a 1, we're going to add 1 to a 1's counter. And each time we roll a 2, we're going to add 1 to a 2's counter, and so on. Well, we could do something like that. We'd need the, uh, the random library. And we could create six variables, like the number of times you rolled 1, r1 equals 0 r2 equals 0, r3 equals 0. We would keep going if we were going to implement this completely. And then let's create our loop. For x in range 100, we're going to roll 100 times. Now let's get a value. Value is equal to random dot r-a-n-d-i-n-t 1 comma 6. Make it a number between 1 and 6. Don't put that colon there like I did. That's a mistake. And then you'd have some if statements. If value equals equals 1 colon, r1 plus equals 1. L if value equals equals 2 colon, r2 plus equals 1. L if value equals equals 3 colon, r3 plus equals 1. And so on. We, we do them all up to the maximum value of it, right? We could make an R4 that would keep, keep track of the number of fours that we rolled and the number of fives that we rolled and the number of six that we rolled and so on. Now this is a big old nasty chunk of code here. If we have to have like, you know, six different if statements to check for the values between one and six, or what if we're playing Dungeons and Dragons and we're rolling a 20-sided dice, we'd have to have 20 if statements. Or if you're generating random numbers between 1 and 100, you have to have 100 if statements. No, that, that, that's, that's a lame way of doing it. This would be a better way of doing it. Create an array of roles. It needs to be 6 long. Doesn't have to be. We can make it... Yeah, let's do 20-sided dice now. So we're going to create an array of length 20. And now we're going to write the same kind of loop here. For x in range 
100 colon value equals random dot R E N D I N T one comma twenty. And then rolls subscript value in subscript plus equals one. Now if we had one to Wanted this one to support numbers up to 20, we would have had to declare 20 different variables. And we would have had to have written 20 different if statements. This scales up so that if we want to do generate numbers between 1 and 10 million, we just change that to 10 million and change that to 10 million. Okay, that'd probably crash. But, you know, 10,000 would be very easily doable. We could put 10,000 there and put 10,000 there. I would not want to create 10,000 different R variables and write 10,000 different if statements. Now this one's got a glitch and it would create an error eventually, which is that our random number is going to be between 1 and 20. But if we have, for example, if we have this array list right here, Bob, Sam, and Joe, this is an array of link 3. Well, what's the first index? What's the index number of Bob? That's zero, and so what's the index number of Sam? One, the index number of Joe is two. So since it's an array length of three, we can access elements zero through two. Well, since this is 20, we can access elements zero through 19 rather than one to 20. So we could either increase this one by one so that it wouldn't give us an error when we try to set the 20th element of it. That's probably the easiest way. And then ignore the first one. And then we could print this out. We could print our list out. But instead of starting at 0, I'm going to start at 1. So 4 i in range 1 comma LEN rolls, close parentheses, close parentheses, colon. Let's print I and then rolls subscript I. And we can make this print statement a little bit fancier. I, comma, quote, was rolled, end quote, comma, And then after that square break, say there, comma, quote, many times. All right. And so when we rolled the dice 100 times, our 20-sided die, we rolled a 1 five times, we rolled a 2 eight times, we rolled a 3 one time, we rolled a 1. This is what's known as a linear distribution. It's not a bell curve distribution. The number of ones rolled should have been about the same as the number of 20s rolled and so on. And yeah, it kind of veered off a little bit, but if we did it over a much larger number of rolls, like if we said, uh, I'm really curious if we rolled these dice 10,000 times, what the values would be, then we'd see Nah, that's not the one I want to change. Right here. I'm changing it to roll that die 10,000 times. And so the numbers are going to be larger, but they ought to be closer together in magnitude. Right. On average, each one was rolled about 500 times. If you add dice together, you get a bell curve distribution. Like if you roll two dice, you may be comfy with the idea that you roll two dice, the, you're going to roll a seven a lot more often than you're going to roll a two or a twelve. But there's no reason to, uh, to give two different examples covering the same point. So the array made it much easier for us to keep track of the tallies. The number of dependents, or the number of the families with this many dependents, the number of times we rolled a six, the number of times we rolled a seventeen, or whatever. All right, let me come look. Yep. 
is that originally we had this as 0, 20 there, and then if you run that, it's going to crash. The reason why is the list is out of range. Why? Because the number that we generated with our random number generator here has an upper bound of 20, but if you have a list, if you have an array of link 20, its upper bound is 19. So, just to allow us to go ahead and do that, I did that. The other thing I could have done is I could have instead subtracted one from my value before I stuck it, right? I could have done, like, you know, minus one there. That would have accomplished the same thing, but I'm going to leave it like that. Leave it, leave it the way it was. So I'm pushing that back to 20. One. So using constants with arrays. Using constants in several ways. You can use a constant to hold the size of the array as the array values or as subscripts. I don't care about using a constant as an array value, but for example, we want to store 20 test scores. Num scores equals 20. Scores equals, let's allocate our array, zero, so square zero in square times, quote, num scores. Now you want to print those scores out? We've been using the len, the, uh, LEN function to get the length of it, but we could do this for i in range parentheses num scores in parentheses colon. Print scores subscript. I. Since we have the ability of asking the array how long it is with the len function, that's preferable. But some languages don't give you that option. If you're doing programming in C or C++, then the array will not tell you its own length. And so it's a really good idea to store the length of an array in a constant so that you can then use it for your, to support your for loops. Constants can be used to store the length of the array. And you, and you do that if you can't call LEN, if your language does not have an, a length function to get the length of the array. You do this for languages like C and C++ that do not have an array length function. Or you can use the constants as the subscripts. We're going to have seven days worth of sales, except that's way too many, so we're only going to have like three days worth of sales. Num underscore sales Nah, I'm not going to make this too, uh, too complicated. Anyways, sales is equal to, let's just make, yeah, zero, close square, times seven, seven days in a week. Now, Monday equals zero, Tuesday equals one, Wednesday equals two, and so on. And so we could say sales subscript Monday in subscript equals, you know, we sold $789 that day. Sales subscript Tuesday equals 456 and whatever, right? You know, we could keep going, but I only declared three days worth. And there we go. So in this case, we're using constants as our subscripts just to make the code look a little bit easier to read, right? Rather than just having to know, oh, sales subscript zero is supposed to be Monday and sales subscript one is supposed to be Tuesday. We're calling it out it very explicitly. I don't actually see people do that that very often. But the book mentioned it, Sean, so I'm showing it to you. You can also use subscripts 
excuse me, constants as subscripts, as shown below. I haven't run it in a while to make sure I don't have any syntax errors. I guess that'd be a good thing to do. All right. It just printed out 20 sales. That's why we have 20 zeros in a row. That's a result of this, right? If we change num scores to five, we only have five scores to worry about. It's only going to print out five. Like that. By the way, this was what's known as a histogram. This thing up here where we were calculating the number of times we rolled a one, and number of two, and the number of three, and so on. So. The above is a histogram that gathers the frequency of random numbers generated. Why histogram? And we can see that we rolled a 25 times and we rolled a 9, a, you know, 17 times and so on. It just gives us a little graph. We could write this information out, import it into Excel, create a pretty graph of it. We could draw a crude graph with asterisks, whatever. So that's what this is doing. So that it uses an array to keep tally of random numbers. So that's what that did there. Here's our example. Indiana apparently is uh, state number five, so we wanted to outprint, we wanted to output sales array for Indiana, and you would give each state a different number. Searching an array for an exact match is called a linear search. This will be about the last thing we need to do because I want to stop and, and give a real quick preview, preview of our exam. A linear search is uh, just when you walk down in a line, checking something. I want to find out who here, age is 23. I go, are you 23 years old? And you go, no, I'm not. Are you 23 years old? No. I keep going until finally somebody messes up with me. 23 years old. And I go, okay, I'm done. I found it. I found the person. Linear search. You just go from beginning to end. Did we do a linear search on the last chunk of code? So for example, let's make, we have that phone number, right? We had a good old Jenny's phone number. I'm going to type it again. You don't have to type it again. You already have it up there. 8, comma, 6, comma, 7, comma, 5, whatever. 3, 0, oh, 9, and see, I'm messing it all up. All for Pete's sake. And say I want to replace a 0 with a different number. Well, I'm going to have to find out the position of zero. Well, what i got to do is I have to have a loop that will iterate through it. I'm looking for it. So my target, my seek target, is the value zero. That's what I'm looking for. And I'm going to need another variable to indicate where I found it. And so I'm going to call found at. I'm going to set that equal to negative one. If we get all the way to the end of the list and we never found it, then found that is still going to equal negative 1. But as, as we search the array, if we do find it, then find, found that is going to be updated with the index. Will be the index of the target value. So we're going to write yet another while loop, or for loop. For i in range parentheses, len, parentheses, Jenny, close parentheses, close parentheses, colon. And we're going to check to see if that specific number is equal to our target. Why don't we look for target 5? Number 0 is kind of, you don't know why it's being set to 0. Let's add a comment then. 
we are looking for the 5. So if Jenny subscript I equals equals target, then we found it. Print found it. And let's keep, for safekeeping, the value of I so we could use it later. Found at equals I. So I hope you can see what we're doing. We've been, we've been using our for loops to print the items out, right? Print the first item, print the second item, print the third item. Here we're checking. Is the first item equal to our target? No, it wasn't. Is the second item equal to our target? No, it wasn't. The third one equal to our target? Yep, it sure is. So we print found it and we record that we found it at position three. And so this is a linear search algorithm. Linear search, use a loop to check item by item, element by uh, or to see which element matches our target. And so at the end of this, we just need to see whether we hit it or not. And so if found that is still equal to negative 1, it means that this never happened. And the only way that this never happens is if we search the entire string and we never find our target. So if found at equals equals negative 1 colon, we're going to print a message, print parentheses quote, target in parentheses comma, Target, comma, quote, not found, end quote, in parentheses. Else, colon, we did find it. Print parentheses, quote, target, end quote, comma, target, comma, quote, found at index, end quote, comma, found at. Sorry, there are so many commas and quotes in that. Looking at it makes it easier to read than if you were trying to listen to what I said. It worked. All right. And so, in our phone number, 8675309, there was a 5, and it was found in position 3. 0, 1, 2, 3, it sure was. So there's no 2 in this. So if I change our target to 2, then it's going to say it was never found. Right. It went through it. It did not find it. Leave that back. All right. Okay, so what's going to be on the exam? Your quizzes are your best bet. Go ahead and do the quiz over this chapter. Make sure that we have a link to it. And yes, we haven't gotten through the entire chapter, but that's okay. You know, maybe when we come in on Thursday, you know, excuse me, Wednesday after the exam, we can all do it together to make sure that we get 100 on the, you know, on the quiz or whatever. Just do it as well as you can up to the material that we have covered. So that's chapter 6. And we really have covered a, a majority of the material. Yeah, that's why this says uh, due on May 5. So go ahead and get the Unit 6 exam done. Review the exams for four and five.
All right, so questions like this, and I'll post these as notes, so you don't necessarily have to type them along. But if you have something like this, A is equal to, you know, Bob, Fred, Joe, and Stan. And then you say x equals a subscript 2. Then what's x equal to? The third one. What is, yep. what is x equal to? It's equal to Joe. And yes, I should have put quotes around and stuff like that. So if you have this list, this array, what is the index of the first element? What is the index of the last element? And then what is the length? All right, so what is the index of the first element? It's like the fourth time we've said this in this particular lecture. First element of an array is always index or subscript zero. zero. Right. So the index of the first element is zero. What's the index of the last element? Yep, zero, one, two, three, four. Right? So what is the length of it? Five. Five. And so a fancy way of saying it is that the subscript can be... 0 to n minus 1, where n is equal to length. It's just going to only go up to minus 1, or, you know, the length minus 1. Length is 5, the last element is going to be a 4. Write code that would print the A array. How about if you have something like this? DEF Bob takes a variable x and returns x times 2. And then you have another function called Fred that takes a value and returns x times 10. What will happen if we call print Bob 10 and then print Fred 5. What is it going to print out? Well, what's this call going to print? It's going to jump up, multiply it by 2, return it. It's going to print out 20. So that would print out a 20, and then this one passes a 5 in. It turns 10 times that, so it would print. a while loop or a for loop that will count from 1 to 10. Hope you know how to do that by now. That one doesn't have anything to do with arrays, right? It's just you can use a while loop or a for loop to do it. Write a line of code that creates an array consisting of 10 zeros. We've done that a couple of different ways. 
right? You could do this. A is equal to, what am I going to do here? I'm going to put that, and then since it's 10 elements long, what am I going to show? What's next? Asterisk 10. That's one way. Or if you're feeling like doing it in old school, I mean, with an initializer list, you could do this, and then just put in 10 commas. Either way works. This is far better. What's the function that you use to, to add, to append something to an array? So make an empty list named L, append the value 100 to it. So how do I make an empty list? L equals like that. And then how do we append to it? L dot append. Yeah. Like that. So whatever you set your array to not append, right? Um, sorry, sorry. The, the brackets mean you create an array, right? Right. This is an empty array. Empty array, and L is the variable that you assign to it, right? Right. So the, the correct syntax is to put whatever you assign, what variable you assign to that array. And then dot append. Right? right, right. So you could do scores is equal to, you know, and then scores dot append, I made a 90. Okay. Like that, right. I just want to make sure. Right. Write a single line of code that creates a list, parentheses array, named peanuts, and places and initializes it with the names of four cartoon characters. So, something like peanuts equals, and then you'd put, you know, Snoopy. Charlie Brown, etc. Right, however many we we needed, and then write a line of code that will append a name. You said this will be in the notes. Yep, yep. I'm uploading this as is. Now moving on to slicing. Slicing works of both arrays and strings. We've done slicing, yes? Somebody shake their head at me and say yes. Please. Have we done this? Have we done something like A is equal to, you know, Darth Vader, and then we do print A subscript 1 colon 3. Does that look familiar? All right. No shame in that. We haven't done slicing yet. That's a real drag. Okay. I kind of see why we did that, why we haven't done it. No slicing. I need to make a comment to myself to do that. All right. So pretty much I just focused on the kind of new material that we've been doing. The kind of stuff that we've done in the previous exam is also fair game, right? Like write an if statement that says if age is less than 12, print, you know, go home junior, that kind of thing. Or doing a flowchart of an if statement or a flowchart with a while loop in it, all that kind of stuff is fair game. And it's not designed to be a killer exam, so 
and then you have the fallback if uh, you know you don't think you did great on it. Come back in Thursday, or Wednesday. Come in anyway on Wednesday. We'll review the exam, and if you feel like taking final, you can do that. All right, let's make a Dropbox.